All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MIT Category Seminar, the online version. So we have moved the seminar online because of the coronavirus outbreak. So we don't want to uh, cancel our activities, but we want to do this as safe as possible for everyone. So this is the first talk. Uh, I'm not going to be the speakers. We are also preparing to have remote speakers as well. Uh, so please be patient in case we have problems. We are trying all to do our best. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to see you all here. You're many people. That's really great. So um, first of all, there is a chat. Uh, some of you are writing there already. So let's use that for discussions, for questions, and in case of any problems. Uh, keep in mind, so uh, in order for the stream to be as smooth as possible, there is a buffer of about 10 seconds. So that means that if you write something there, I'll be able to answer. So you will receive my answer only after some seconds, all right? Should be enough to have questions, but keep that in mind. And uh, another thing, so if you would like to be a speaker, uh, if you have any type of feedback, or if you're one of the next scheduled speakers for the seminar, please let us know. We can decide how to uh, how to make it work with the distance. All right. So yeah, uh, let's get started. Um, so I'm going to talk about partial evaluations. So this is the work part of the work that I've been doing with the ACT school with my group of the ACT school last year. Uh, I was the TA of that group. The group was led by Tobias Fritz, and there are um, three more people in the group. So there were the students of the school, Carmen Constantin, Martin Lundfall, and Brandon Shapiro. Um, all right, so what's this talk going to be about? Um, we're going to talk about monads. Okay, so let's quickly recap what a monad is. Uh, for the people that don't know, uh, a monad consists of a functor, an endofunctor in a certain category, together with two natural transformations called unit and composition, or multiplication, one from the identity to t, one from t applied twice to t that satisfy these diagrams. Now, I'm going to motivate this in a second, so if you have never seen this, don't worry. If you have seen this, just be patient, I'll be there in a second. So what is a monad for us? A way to see what a monad is, is a way to form spaces of formal expressions or like formal operation. Let's work in the category of sets for simplicity, but of course this is more general as long as one allows for generalized elements. So how does this work? We can think of sets as containing elements which we think of as variables, okay? The set X contains, for example, X1, X2, X3, and so on. Could be infinite. Now, what does the endofunctor do? The endofunctor takes a set and gives us a new set of like formal expressions in our variable. For example, formal sums. So here I will use the example of formal sums for the most part. So what does it mean formal? That means that this plus, like x1 plus x2, is not a real sum. We're not computing the sum. We're just writing this down formally. Or like from a point of view of theoretical computer science, in some, in some extent, this means that this plus does not have access to the actual value of x1 and x2. So that's why we put them in a box. So plus is blind to these variables. We're just writing this down. Okay, so there's binary sums. We can form ternary sums. We can form just unary sums. So just, that's just x1 seen as a sum of one term. Even the empty sum, no terms. Okay, it's kind of like a placeholder for zero if you want formal all right all right so this is an end of functor so we can iterate it we can apply it twice so ttx will contain formal sums of formal sums or like nested formal sums so you see these are boxes of boxes all right and there's a difference between a plus sign inside and outside these boxes okay so we can have for example this is a sum of like two terms which are each of two terms or this is for example a single sum of a single sum this is an empty box, okay? So this box is one term that contains nothing, or this is like an empty expression. So these two things are different. That's an empty box. Here, we don't even have a box. We have nothing, okay? All right, so that's what the functor does on objects. 
what does it do on morphisms, so of, on functions? So suppose that we have a function from x to y, two sets. Then tf goes from tx to ty. What does it do? So it takes a formal expression of tx, has some things in a box, and what does it do? It just applies f inside the box. If you're familiar with Haskell, think of fmap, okay? That's what it really does. It, it applies the function inside the box. Okay, so that's the endo functor. And uh, so every system of the sort with possible different operations gives rise to a monad, and every monad on set can be actually written in this form as long as one allows for possibly infinite, infinitary terms. Imagine infinite sums or infinite operations, okay? So, of course, uh, different, uh, different presentations of this give, may give rise to the same monad, right? All right, um, so what does the unit do? The, the unit takes an element of x and puts it in tx. How? Well, just, you know, puts a box around it. And the multiplication removes the outer boxes. So you see here we have boxes of boxes. Here we just have boxes, and we're removing the outer ones. So if you're in computer science, imagine it's flattening the array. We could have a list of lists, and we just you know, concatenate or flatten. All right? So that's what the multiplication does. And now, what do the monad diagrams say, really? OK, so the first one says that, OK, we have some boxes. And what eta does, it puts all of this inside a box. What mu does, it removes the outer box. And you see, that's the same as doing nothing. So that's what the first diagram said. So if you want, it tells us that our interpretation in terms of boxes is consistent. The second diagram is similar, but here we have t applied to the unit. So what does the t apply to something do? It applies that stuff inside the boxes. So what do we do? We have again our formal expression. We're applying eta inside the box. So each one of these has its own little box. So again, we have double boxes, but different from before. Again, you see, if you remove the outer boxes, then again, we get back to where we started. So this also commutes, all right? And uh, the third diagram, the associativity diagram, sometimes it's called. So what do we do? We have t, 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 x, so three levels of boxing. What do we do? So, OK, mu removes the outermost box. t mu does, for each box, in this case, for each outer box, it applies mu. So inside this big box, it removes removes the boxes. So basically, it removes the middle boxes. Okay, so these two expressions differ. However, now apply, apply mu again, so remove the outer boxes that you're left with. You see what mu is doing is basically remove the, the boxes that we didn't remove before. And so the result is again the same. All right. So you can interpret all these diagrams as telling us, well, mu and eta are all about adding and removing boxes, and all of this is consistent, right? Um, so, OK, naturality of mu and eta basically say that they just look at the box and not at what's inside the box. They don't change the value inside the box. They just change its container, all right? Um, all right, so, so far, all these expressions were formal. We didn't have access to the variable. There are some places, however, where sums make sense. x plus y, what is that? We don't know. But 2 plus 1 is 3. So what is an algebra? An algebra is a situation, an object, where, where, where it makes sense to remove the boxes and then evaluate the resulting expression. OK? So in the case of sums, commutative monoids, there it makes sense to take sums. OK? So what's the definition? Well, it's an object, a special one, equipped with a map from TA to A, so from formal expressions to elements, which we can think of as assigning to each formal expression its actual result. And some diagrams have to commute. So first of all, this is called unit uh, diagram. What does this say? OK, take an element, like you think of it as a number, f turn it into a formal expression. What does it mean? Just you know, put it in a box. Form the formal expression that only has that number. What's the result of this? 2 plus nothing else. Well, it has to be 2. 
all right? Or if you want, adding and removing the box is the same as doing nothing, okay? And more important, the multiplication square or algebra square says that if you have a nested formal expressions, so two levels of boxing. Now here what we can do is, okay, we can either remove the outer box, so denest, or we can apply e to each term. So to each of these boxes, of, the, of these big boxes, to each of this, we look inside and we remove the inner boxes and evaluate what we have, okay? This, of course, gives us a different expression, but again, removing the remaining boxes, or like evaluating in total, we get the same result. You see, 3 plus 3 is 6, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6, okay? So if you want, this tells us that TTA really can be interpreted as nested formal expression. So denesting and evaluating is the same as evaluating inside and then evaluating the remaining thing. Or if you want, like simplifying the expression and then evaluating it is the same as evaluating first inside and then total. So this is like a packed, packed version of these double sums. And evaluating it is the same as doing this twice. All right? Okay. Um, so maybe this is a good moment uh, to stop. Uh, any questions so far? Anything not clear? Any problems with the sound, with the streaming, or anything at all? Please use the chat. And keep in mind, it will take me some extra seconds to answer the question. Great. So people are saying no problems. Uh, so I'll go on. Thank you for your feedback. Um, all right. So, yeah, different monads give different algebraic structures. So some examples are like monoids, commutative monoids, groups, abelian groups, rings, commutative rings. So lots of algebraic structures. Basically all of them except fields. Well, of course, you can con consider a field as a particular ring, but you don't have a monad for fields. And uh, join some lattices too are algebras of the power set monad. So that's an example of an infinitary one. Convex spaces too, they're algebras of distribution monads and so on. So it's really hard to come up with things which are not encoded by a monad, actually. And especially if you allow for more general categories and sets. All right? Um, so, okay, so so far we were talking about formal expressions and their results. And so far all of this as folklore since the 60s. So that's our background. Let's start, uh, let's start to talk about our actual work. Uh, so, a formal expression can also be evaluated partially. So what do I mean by this? So we would like to say that if I have 2 plus 3 plus 4, of course, this is equal to, well, 9. But how did I even do 9 in my head? Well, first I did. 2 plus 3 is 5, and then 5 plus 4 is 9. Okay? So halfway, I was here. So there's something like a middle step. This can also be partially evaluated into this. If you think about computers, right? That's what they do all the time. Like in case of sums, for example, you know, there's this like folding of a list, but in general, uh, it's like even more, you know, more generally, maybe you may want to like first sum two and four, like if it had been maybe two and eight, you want to say, let's do those first because it's 10, you know, there are all sorts of strategies to go to the total result. And how do you encode these mathematically? All right, well, the idea is that, okay, we have to encode mathematically the idea of doing these two numbers first. So we came up with is, well, there is actually a nested formal expression that has these grouped and this alone. And now, you see that removing the outer boxes, so denesting, you get back to here. But evaluating, or like removing the inner boxes and evaluating what's inside, you get this one. All right? So if you think about it, that's, that's kind of what it means 
to do this first. To group this expression, evaluate the single groups, and the partial evaluation is basically just, you know, evaluating just the single groups locally, partially. Okay, so we know how to talk about removing the inner and outer boxes, right? These are just our structure maps. So this is a nested formal expression, TTA, of some algebra. This is map mu, and this is map TE. So here's our rigorous definition. Given P and Q in TA. So in sets, of course, these are elements. If you are in a different category, you want arrows into TA. Okay, but let's stick to elements for simplicity. It's it should be clear how to do this more generally. So um, if you have P and Q in TA, you call Q a partial evaluation of P and P a partial decomposition of Q. If there is an element in TTA, such as applying mu gives us P and applying TE gives us Q. Sometimes we call this element M the partial evaluation or like the westness of a partial evaluation or the instruction so that's actually if you want it's constructive this tells you how to evaluate this expression into this expression okay all right so that's our definition first thing we can do is a consistency check so here are some basic properties that tell us that this makes sense first of all Given an expression, then there's a partial evaluation to itself. You can always partially evaluate it by doing nothing. So doing nothing is a partial evaluation or a partial decomposition. Somehow the is the identity arrow, if you want. How? Well, from every TA you can form an element of TTA by applying T eta. So what does this do? It adds boxes inside. Alright? And you see that here now, if we either remove the inner or the outer box, we get back to. The original, all right. Of course, what we are really, what you're really doing here is that um, these two diagrams commute, like commute with identity by the unit, uh, unit diagram of the monad and the unit diagram of the algebra under T. Okay, so. Um, so every partial evaluation is a partial evaluation of itself. And moreover, total evaluations are a special case of partial evaluation. So what's a total evaluation? So I mean, okay, you can evaluate this and then put it in a box. So you can have again a formal expression that we can think of as like, it's like a partial evaluation, but it's like total, right? It's in the image of the unit. All right. There is a partial evaluation from here to here. How? Well, okay, this diagram, first of all, commutes by naturality of eta. And the resulting term in TDA is such that, of course, applying TE gives our total evaluation, as we see here, but also applying mu. Again, by the other unit condition, gives us two times three. Okay? So this is consistent. Doing nothing is a partial evaluation. We have like identity arrows, if you want. And we have total evaluation. So those are a special case. Makes sense because partial evaluations should generalize evaluations. So that makes sense. All right. In terms of rewrite system, so if you write this as like really arrows, what this tells us is that this is uh, reflexive, so you can stay where you are. And moreover, this is confluent. Why is this confluent? Well, somewhat trivially. So given this expression, uh, you can either partial evaluate by grouping these two or grouping these three, for example. And you can always go back, like you, these at some point will agree. Like, if anything, just take the total evaluation. That's going to be the same no matter which path we choose. Okay, so that's confluent. All right, so I see there's a question. So some people are saying that this is a bit confusing because formally, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is a shorthand for bracket 1 plus 2 and 3. So maybe, uh, yeah, let's uh, actually go to the board because the future viewers may not see this. So somebody is saying that uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is actually shorthand for 1 plus 2 plus 3. 
So, okay, uh, that's a good question. So it depends. It really depends. Uh, so if you are in a situation where you want to uh, just define sums in terms of binary sums, uh, so, for example, if you want to define the sum of a list by folding it, then that's true. Or if you want to present your theory by saying that a ternary sum is just an iterated binary sum, then yes. Okay? But be careful. Uh, brackets are not boxes, eh? Okay? So, either... So, in that case, TA contains both this and this. And actually, TA contains equivalence classes of this. It contains this, and in its, in its equivalence class, you also have this. These two have to agree by associativity, alright? So as equivalence classes, these two things are the same, okay? So you can think of TA as being equivalence classes of these things, and this of being, so this ter triple sum has been a placeholder for this equivalence class, okay? So that's different than boxes. Boxes, on the other hand, live in TTA, okay? So in TTA, we have 1 plus 2 in a box, plus 3 in a box, and actually these numbers, so I haven't written the inner box, so these things are actually in their own box. So this is not the same as this. One in its box plus two plus three. Okay? So in NTA, so once you remove the boxes, you get to TA, and these two things agree. That's why you're allowed not to remove, uh, to not to write the brackets. But as elements of TTA, these things are different. Okay. A way to see this is that if you don't apply mu, if you apply instead TE. That, what does that mean? Evaluate these big boxes. So you see, here you got, okay, three in a box, plus three, you see. Here, you get one in a box, plus five, okay? So these two things are not the same, okay? So I hope this answers the question, so be careful. This is not about how we present the theory by using brackets, all right? That's encoded. So TTA is like really formal boxing, all right? So I hope, uh, I hope this, uh, this is clear now. But thanks for asking, because uh, this could be confusing for possibly many people, so yeah. Uh, when you do a partial evaluation, you're not looking at brackets, right? Because otherwise you could also partially evaluate this other one. So boxes are somehow stronger than brackets, if you want, all right? Inside the box, there's an equivalence class of brackets in case you want to use brackets. All right, um, so maybe let's go back to... Uh, our main talk, but again, thanks for the question. And uh, you see, uh, we were saying that uh, as a rewrite system, this is trivially confluent by just, you know, take the total evaluation. Sometimes, of course, you can have confluence even before that, but, you know, worst case, the total evaluation thinks, uh, tells you that it's confluent. All right. Um, the irreducible elements are the total evaluation. So what does that mean? That after total evaluation, you can't go further. The only way is just to stay there. There is an arrow because it's reflexive, but it doesn't take you anywhere else. Okay? Now, um, here are some examples. So, 
if you take the semigroup monad, so imagine like before, except that we have no neutral element. And uh, as algebra, take natural numbers and products instead of sums. All right? So the partial decompositions are the factorizations. And the total decompositions are the composition into primes. So as a rewrite system, this thing looks like this. You see, you have, for example, a number. A formal expression it could be, I don't know, 6 times 5 times 11. You see, you can, of course, partially evaluate it by, for example, multiply 6 and 5. You get to 30 times 11. Or even totally evaluate, you get to 330. Or you can decompose. So what is this thing a partial evaluation of? Well, 6 is 2 times 3. And you see, you can't go further than here. That You stop here. You stop here because you cannot multiply by 1. We're not taking 1. Otherwise, you would be able to multiply by 1. But you see, so factorization into prime is a total decomposition. More generally, any kind of factorization is a partial decomposition. So in this case, you see, in this case of natural numbers and products, the interest in direction is backward. Like, sometimes you're interested in factorizing more than in multiplying. All right. Um, here's another example. So this is one of my favorite examples of monads, the action monad. So you have a monoid. So in set, you take a monoid or a group. Uh, in uh, More generally, in a monoidal category, you can take an internal monoid. So the thing is, uh, forming the, the tensor or Cartesian product with it is a monad, where the unit and multiplication come from the one of the monoid. If you didn't know this, try as an exercise. So if you're a computer science a scientist, this is sometimes called the writer monad. Okay, the, this is a monoid, for example, strings, and you know, quasi-morphism give you also a string. All right. So the the action monad is sometimes called the writer monad in computer science. So algebras are G spaces. So space is equipped with a G action. Again, if you didn't know, try to work it out yourself. That's a good example. And, well, okay, formal expressions, now, okay, in here you have an element of A and an element of G, okay? So formal expressions are like a formal translation, so we could apply G to X and, like, move it, but we don't do it, it's formal. So plugging in the, for the, the definition of partial evaluation, we get this complicated thing, an element of G times G times A, so here we have two elements of G and an element of A, such as this. Hold, what does that really mean? So what it means is the following. So let's write GX as this formal arrow. So we could go from X to G times X, okay? But that's a potential action. We don't actually do it, right? So, okay. If you want, you can think of if X as being where we are, and G is how much gas we have in our tank. So we could go all the way to here. That's our translation. Or maybe how much time we have to go there, okay? So what's a partial evaluation? A partial evaluation is, well, just use half of your guess, or, well, part of your guess, okay? So partial evaluation, you just move partially, so you get to a new place, Y, which is X with the action of L, where L is a decomposition of G. So we can decompose G as, you know, First move of L and then move of H. Okay, that's G. And apply to X only L. Okay? So it's a partial translation. You're just on the way there. And of course, in the tank, you still have the rest of the gas that you have not used. Now, this is interesting for mono monoid actions because... For monoids, you can't go back. So once you use up your gas, you're done. It's not like, you know, if you go back, you recover your gas. For group actions, instead, you do. So for group actions, actually, this is just another element of the same orbit because you can go in a circle, so everything is a partial evaluation as long as you don't leave your orbit. But for monoids, for monoid actions, this is interesting, okay? Because that's really, that really has an idea of going, of like partially moving across the orbit because the orbits are directed or at least parts of the orbits are directed. Somebody is asking, do we want the internal monoid to be associative? Yes. Monoids 
have to satisfy associativity. Associative and unital. Of course, associativity for internal monoids is encoded by a certain commutative diagram. So maybe it's a good exercise to try to write it down yourself. So I'm saying, of, I'm, I'm saying all of this like uh, by exercise, but you can find all these things in case uh, you want to have a reference. Huh? So for example, the action monad is explained on the NLAP, okay? And also internal monoids. So if you go there, the, the article in the action monad should be quite accessible. You can go there, just look up action monad or writer monad on the NLAP, right? Um, okay. Um, all right, so one thing that you probably by now may be asking is, can you compose partial evaluations? So if you have a partial evaluation and another partial evaluation that starts from where you ended, can you partially evaluate the whole thing in one step? Well, so here's an example. So this four term sum can be of course partially evaluated into two plus two, just, you know, group these two elements and these two and evaluate into two. This two plus two can obviously be partially evaluated, even totally evaluated in this case, two, four. So I'm, use, I'm using a total evaluation here for simplicity, but of course I could have put a partial evaluation. Um, so now, can we partially evaluate this whole thing in two, four? In a single step. Of course, we can do it if we do two steps. Just use these. Can you do one step? Well, intuition says yes, right? I mean, okay, just do the total evaluation. But how do we do that? Um, so, okay, look at this two. Can we decompose this two? Well, this two corresponds to this two here, right? Up to rebracketing. And how did we obtain this two? This was one plus one. How did how do we know? Well, because it, you know it comes from here. Okay, so now replace this two here with the way we obtain it. So replace this two by one plus one in the box. And the same here. And now pack the instruction by removing the middle boxes. You know, flatten inside. So, because we have to remove the grouping into this two and this two, that's exactly what we want to get rid of. That's by applying T mu that removes the middle level boxing. And that's it. You see that removing the outer boxes gives us the first expression, and removing the inner boxes gives us the second one. All right? So, that's how we would like to compose partial evaluations. However, this is not always possible. Uh, so we worked last year with ACT school quite hard actually to come up with a counter example because at some point we were starting to get intuition that it's too nice that they always can compose, uh, can, that they always can be composed. So we had to come up with a slightly involved example to come up with a counter example. So bear with me. So take the same rank, which is like polynomials in T with natural number coefficients, where t squared is equal to 2. So here's what I mean for the non-algebraically minded. Um, so, wait, sorry. Um, the idea is that the elements of the semi-ring are in the form a plus bt, where a and b are natural numbers. So think of, uh, think of complex numbers. What are complex numbers? These are like sums like a plus bi, where you know, i is not real, but a and b are, except that, so for complex numbers, i is not real, but however, i squared is real. i squared is minus one, right? So for us instead, first it's, first of all, we want natural numbers, not real numbers, and t squared is two, is not negative one. We don't have negatives, okay? t squared is two, okay? But for the rest, there are little sums like this. So, of course, you can sum them by just adding the, the, the non-t part and the t part, just like, you know, real and imaginary part. And the multiplication is, as usual, using distributive law, except that t squared 
is 2. So you see here, instead of having t squared b1, b2, we get 2b1, b2, all right? Now, t and 1 are linearly independent over n. So just like, you know, complex numbers like 1 and i are two different directions. So as, as a real vector space, these are two are linearly independent. However, they are linked multiplicatively. Okay, as, as soon as you square t, then they're not independent anymore. A bit like complex numbers. All right, so that's our same array. And now we take the free S semi-module monad. What does that mean? Okay, let's construct the formal expressions uh, like in an explicit way. So again, take a set whose elements we think of as variables. And uh, here, tx will form formal expressions. So they remember, they always have these binary sums where x1 has no coefficient and x2 has possibly a coefficient. Okay? Of course, you can put more stuff without the t. You can put nothing, you can put more stuff with the t, and so on, okay? So these are like formal sums, except that you m can put a t in front of the box, or no t, as you prefer. There's the rule that whenever you have a repeated sum of the same element, so twice an element, then this is the same as t squared, okay? Addition, multiplication, and distributivity apply with this rule. Okay. Now, as algebra, we take the simplest possible one. We just take the terminal set, the one element set, the zero semi-module. Like, imagine the zero vector, zero vector space, something like that. So you see, any formal expression in this is evaluated to just zero. I mean, any formal expression just goes to zero because that's the only element of this set. It's a very simple, uh, very simple uh, example, very trivial. But it's enough to give us a counter example. How? Well, okay, so... There is a partial evaluation from 0 to 0 plus 0. How? Well, okay, take here the empty box, a box with containing nothing, and the box containing a box containing 0. So you see, remove the outer boxes, so this one just disappears, this is just nothing, and here we get 0. And removing the inner boxes here, you see, evaluating nothing gives us 0, and all of this happens inside the box. And evaluating this other one gives us again zero, because evaluating everything gives us zero. And again, this happens inside the box. Just as well, there's a partial evaluation from t squared zero to t zero. How? Well, you have t box, t box zero, so here it doesn't simplify. Now, if you, however, remove this outer box, then it's t squared, and that does simplify. That's equal to this. Okay, and if you evaluate here, well, whatever happens inside this box just goes to zero. Okay, so there's a partial division from here to here and from here to here. However, these two things are equal for our theory. Now, claim there's no direct partial evaluation from here to here. Again, of course we can do it in two steps, but not in one. Why? Well, roughly the argument goes as follows. So... Suppose that you have, suppose that you had something here that is such that, you know, removing the brackets, removing the outer box, sorry, goes to zero, and removing the inner boxes, or evaluating the inner stuff, goes to here. So, okay, this evaluation is, happen is happening inside the box, so the only thing that can happen is that up here we have t of something, and then this something is evaluated to zero. Okay, everything is evaluated to zero, so yeah. So on the right hand side, the constraint is satisfied. Okay, but what is this something? So we want to find something such that if you remove this box, and so you get t something, the same thing, you get zero in a box. Now this is not possible. So if something is nothing, then here we would get nothing, and that's not zero in a box. If something is a term, a linear term in zero that 
does not contain t, so it's a natural number compared uh, multiplying zero. Then by applying t, we get a number that's proportional to t, and this is not. And if we have a mixed term here, then we get something that has t and a number that's at least as large as two without the t, but not one. So there's no something, so no thing can give us this zero in a box only once if you multiply by t. So there's no partial evaluation, okay? So that's the counterexample. Okay, it's a good moment to answer questions. So something is, somebody is saying, going in the dire reverse direction is mu, is counted as a partial evaluation? No, it's not. Okay? So you can actually go back in the video if you want. Uh, if you want to uh, to see what I said before. In case you you can't or you don't want to because you don't want to like uh, miss the live stream, don't worry because we will upload an HD version of this uh, video on YouTube later. So you will have all the time to uh, to look uh, to look at this properly. All right, um, let's go forward. Um, so first of all, um, how then do we, um, how do we compose partial evaluations? So how, what can we use to compose partial evaluations? Um, well, it turns out that composing partial evaluations can be thought of as a source of higher dimensional rewriting. So what does that really mean? Okay, suppose you have the algebra of our monad. So the algebra comes equipped with a structure map. Okay, that's the algebra. And we said that the total evaluation, so the total result is just like the tip of the iceberg of something. Of what? Well, of the system of partial evaluations, which consists of like TTA, so where a partial evaluation is witnessed, with the maps mu and TE, which are like source and target and a map from TA to TTA that gives us this reflexivity, the trivial one, okay? So that's like a reflexive graph. Turns out this is again just the tip of the iceberg of a much larger iceberg because we can just go forward and write all the maps that are related to this. And you see here, this triply nested formal expressions where, where we were substituting whenever we were able to compose and t mu was the one giving us the composite cell. So we have actually way more maps here that satisfy some identities because these maps down here, the etas, basically add boxes at certain levels, like inner or outer, and these mu's and e remove boxes at certain levels. And so on, we could go to t, 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 a, and so on, I'll not write it, but you can go on forever. And there's always these identities that tell us that adding and removing boxes is the same as doing nothing, and that removing boxes and then removing boxes at, at the next level is the same as removing boxes at the next level and then the remaining boxes, which correspond to like all these naturality and associativity squares here. It, so in other words, uh, this thing is a simplicial set with the simplicial identities given by adding and removing. So the boundary maps are about removing brackets or boxes and the face maps, uh, like the, the degeneracy maps, are about adding boxes. So this simplicial set is called the bar construction, and it turns out that it's very famous. It was invented for group cohomology, because, uh, so for the action monad, basically, where, uh, where G is a group. Uh, but of course it works for more general monads and it's a very important tool in algebraic topology. So it turns out that partial evaluations are the trip tip of the iceberg of this bar construction. Or if you want, they are a nice operational interpretation of the bar construction. So what are the one cells of the bar construction? Those are partial evaluations. And what are two cells? Well, these are compositions. So how is a two simplex a composition, and how is a composition a two simplex? Well, a geometric picture can be given as follows. So, so remember it as composable partial evaluation, so you can view like these composite, so the, 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 sorry, this partial evaluation as like an edge 
going from here to here. And this partial evaluation as an edge going from here to here. A composite would be an edge that goes directly down here horizontally. How do we obtain this one? Well, we take a triple formal expression, so an element of T, 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 A. And now you see that removing the outer boxes give us this, removing the innermost boxes give us this, and removing the mid-level boxes give us an edge here. So this plays the role of a two cell. So geometrically, this is like inside a triangle. It's the interior of this triangle. So a composition is a bit like a rewrite or re of rewrites, except that usually rewrites of rewrites are globular. This is simplicial in flavor, okay? So this is not an arrow between arrows. It's an arrow between two arrows and a composite arrow, okay? So we can use the tools uh, used in homotopy theory to talk about this composition. So this in homotopy theory is called the filler of an inner horn. So a, a horn is this shape, like a part of a triangle, and you fill it if you have the whole triangle and the missing uh, edge, okay? All right, so let's use these tools. First of all, a square in set, so again, you can generalize this, but let's do this for sets, is called a weak pullback or a weakly Cartesian square if the following thing happens. So the square commutes, but moreover, if you have an element B of B and C of C, such that they agree once you map them to D with these maps, then you can find an element of A that goes to C via G and goes to B via F. Now, this may remind you of a pullback. A pullback is precisely this when this element A is unique. Okay? So a pullback says that this has to be unique. Weak pullback, this is not unique. Now, uh, some people here may be into higher category theory. This is not the same as the, the like, the two-dimensional version of a pullback. I'm not doing this weekly in that sense, hey? I'm doing this weekly in the sense that I've just said, and the two notions are not quite the same, okay? So there's no, so the, 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 the diagram here commutes strictly, okay? Uh, but the uniqueness on the element up here is, uh, dropped. Okay, that's a weak pullback or weakly Cartesian square. Okay. Now, recall that a Cartesian monad on a category of pullbacks such as sets, so for us sets, is a monad such as T preserves pullbacks, the functor, and the naturality squares of eta and mu are pullbacks. Okay. Some people, so I think it was first defined by Weber or Weber, uh, the weakly Cartesian monads are the same, except that T has to preserve weak pullbacks, and the naturality squares of these are weak pullbacks. Okay, why are we interested in this? Well, it turns out that um, for monads with a weakly Cartesian mu, like multiplication, so for example, weakly Cartesian monads, the composition is always defined, the composition of partial evaluations. And moreover, if they're even Cartesian, like not just weakly, then composition is uniquely defined. Why? Well, remember what, how we did. We had a formal expression here, one here and one here, and a partial evaluation here that was mapped by mu here, te here, and a partial evaluation here that was mapped by mu here to the same element and te here. Now suppose that this red square is a weak pullback. Then we can find an element up here, so a triply boxed formal expression that makes the diagram commute, that, 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 that closes the diagram. So by mapping it down to TTA, we have our composite partial evaluation. And moreover, if this red diagram is a pullback, not just a weak pullback, the element up here is unique, okay? So we have even a unique triangle, which gives us the composition. That's why, okay? All right, uh, all right, so the question is, when is this, is this square a weak pullback or even a pullback? Okay, so the thing is, we have to say, when two arrows agree in here, uh, well, what does it mean that the things have to agree in here, right? So you said that 
They didn't have to be equal on the nose, as we wrote before on the board. We have certain equivalent classes of things you can write down. Or like before when we were saying like, t squared equals 2, what does it mean that it's equal? Well, what does it mean that two former expressions are equal? That, that means that either they're equal on the nose, that you write the same thing, or they're equal because they're connected by the identities of our theory. Take the theory of groups. So in the theory of groups, associativity tells us that the thing on the left is equal to the thing on the right. Or, of course, you could just write triple multiplications. Also, that x times 1 is the same as x. And 1 times x. And also, that x times x to the minus 1 is 1. Now, clearly, on the nose, the stuff on the left is not the same as the stuff on the right. If it were, we would have, there would be no algebra, right? We would be no, doing nothing when we solved something. But we set them equal. Okay, we want them to be considered as, as equal. Okay, so these are the identities of our theory. Now, for mono, uh, sorry, for a plain operatic identity, it's called like this because, in the finitary case, this makes us, our theory presented by an operad, like by a plain operad, uh, for the people who like operads. So what is, an op uh, what is a plain operatic identity? That tells us that we can write our theory, we can present it in such a way that all the stuff that's on the left of the equal sign is also on the right, like all the variables on the left are also on the right and in the same order. Okay, so here you see left and right just differ by bracketing, which is allowed, and by possibly adding constants, but constants are not variable. One is a constant, it's not variable, okay? So, you see here, everything on the left also appears on the right with the same order. That's the theory of monoids. For the theory of group and monoid actions, so not group, group actions, you see, again, the only two actions are here and again. They just differ by bracketing and constants, okay? So the variables are treated pretty much the same way from the left and to the right. Like if you want, suppose you wanted to write like something like the header, the header file where these methods appear, then there's no need of like uh, overloading anything. Like this takes three arguments and you know, it will always put those three arguments with the same order. There's no need to, uh, no to need to account for different ordering and so on. So that's kind of the intuition. All right? Okay. So, if the theory can be expressed using only plain operatic identities, then the composition square is Cartesian. Now, of course, some theories can be expressed using only plain operatic identities and maybe also presented in ways that are not just plain operatic. But as long as there's one way of presenting it, of presenting it, that's plain operatic, then the composition square is Cartesian. So not just weekly, Cartesian, unique composition. How? Well, look at this. So suppose we have two formal expressions that agree if you remove the outer boxes here and if you evaluate or remove the inner boxes here. Well then, these two things agree down here on the right means that pretty much they're the same thing like almost on the nose. They may differ by some constant, like adding a zero or rebracketing, but not reboxing, rebracketing. But these are basically the same. So it's really easy. You can say, okay, this three was obtained via doing one plus two. And it's really easy to tell because there's not much variability down here. Just when these things agree, agree almost on the nose. And so just substitute this one plus two into this three and you get our element in the top left corner, which gives us the composition. Not much can go wrong here. All right. A symmetric operatic identity is almost like a plain operatic identity in the sense that stuff on the left also has to appear on the right and vice versa. However, we're allowed to change the order. So for example, commutative monoids our symmetric operatic theorem, you see, we also have that x1 plus x2 is equal to x2 plus x1. A bit more relaxed than before. Okay, uh, here, 
If the theory can be expressed using only symmetrical periodic identities, then the composition square is weakly Cartesian. So we again have composition, but we lose uniqueness. Why? So the thing is, let's see an example. So here now, uh, again, when two expressions agree on the, uh, on the top right, uh, then we can still say this 4 was obtained by mapping you know, by this 2 plus 2, and thus 4 by 3 plus 1, and so just substitute. Or, since we can un interchange this thing, now we're free to, like, reorder things, we could also say, that, well, maybe, actually, this 4 corresponds to this 4, so maybe this 4 was not the one obtained using 2 plus 2, but this 4 was obtained using 3 plus 1, and this 4 by 2 plus 2, and it's just, you see, the 4 that stays alone is not obtained by 3 plus 1, it's the one obtained by 2 plus 2. And you see now, up here on the left, these two things do not just all differ by re reordering, because we are moving stuff inside and outside of the box. So as elements of T, 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 A, these two things are different, because they differ in the boxing, not just in the order. Okay? So in this sense, we lose uniqueness. It's somehow, we get a composition, but it's uniquely defined up to reboxing, which, I mean, of course, means it's not uniquely defined, right, since our things are just boxes. So, uh, but still, we can compose things, okay, in multiple ways, in multiple ways to box them. All right, and now we go down to the worst case, non-operatic identities. What's a non-operatic identity? Well, that means that the variable on the left and on the right appear with different multiplicity or don't appear at all, like zero multiplicity. So when in groups, for example, we have that x and x minus 1, x here appears twice on the left, the same x, and it kind of simplifies. You, you know, that's why it's called simplifying. The variable just goes away on the right, so that's not operatic. And the same with SMI modules. Now, with F semi modules, X was appearing twice on the left and only once on the right. Now, okay, some of you may actually say, well, actually, but what if you write this on the left as 2X? Then it's 1 and 1. But that's again, uh, that's again illegal. I mean, that's again non-operatic. Uh, the different, the, the, the reason is, so let's maybe go here. Because if you have X plus X, equals t square x then if you replace this by 2x then you're allowing an extra constant an extra sign and so this thing correspond actually to two identities also this x plus x equals 2x you have to say that 2x is a placeholder for x times x and this one here is non operatic. Okay? Oh, sorry, I, know, I realize now that I have my face there. Uh, so, let me. So, what I wanted to say is that uh, if you want to decompose this and express it as uh, right thing, the thing on the left is 2x, then you have to say that 2x is a placeholder for x times x. And of course, this one, this new one then is non operatic. So, either you never write 2, you just always write x plus x, and then you have the thing above. Or, sorry, square here. Oops. There's a square here. Or, uh, or you allow for the symbol 2, then you write this one. So one way or another, you have to allow for a non-operatic identity. So this theory is non-operatic. Okay? And so you see, for non-operatic identities, well, the composition square may fail to be weakly Cartesian. And the reason is, well, that's the counterexample uh, uh, to before. Uh, so, uh, the counterexample of before, so you see here, these two things are said to be equal, but they differ too much in order to say, look how you obtain this term here and substitute. Like, where is T0 here? That's like, 
there, there, there's no way, okay? That, that's the intuition, of course. The, the, the rigorous thing is a counterexample that I told you before. But, uh, you see, here there's no way to say, found, find out how this thing was obtained. Mm, you just can't do that, all right? You can only do that for operatic identities. And so, yeah, here is a case where we don't know where uh, uh, whether partial composition can be defined in general, and in case uh, we can't. So uh, it's past one. Um, this took uh, a bit longer because I was explaining how this worked and I was accepting questions. Of course, uh, everybody's free to leave. Uh, everybody's free to leave any time, but uh, I will go forward a little bit uh, until the end of the talk, okay? Uh, so if you don't have time, don't worry, we will upload a high resolution version uh, on YouTube uh, once this is over, all right? So yeah, I'll go forward. Um, and we saw that groups have this simplification. You can like take negatives, so they're not operatic. Can we compose things anyway? But well, turns out that for the theory of groups, we can precisely, uh, precisely because we can take differences. So groups form what's called the Malchev theory. So let's explain what this is. Um, the idea is that if you have our square, our composition square, where these two things agree down to the left, then we can, so to say, as element of TTTA in the top left, take something that's a bit like S minus 1 plus T, like the sum of these two minus this. You know, that's sometimes the intuition when you take a pullback. Like, it's like, take these two, but without this, because we have this, we don't want to count this twice. So take one away. A bit like, a bit like inclusion exclusion. In such a way that applying mu somehow simplifies these two and we're left with just S, and applying TTE simplifies these two and we're just left with T. Roughly. So more rigorously. What do I mean? Take these expressions, and so I'm also taking an example where, uh, down here, we are using the non-operatic identity. Because I want to show you that that's not in the way. It's not a problem, okay? So here, you see 5 and 5 inverse appear, uh, inverse formula, and so they're simplified. So these things appear here, but not here. All right, uh, however, what we can do is take this expression. Now, this expression is this element here in a box. Something like minus this element in a box, and like this to the minus one, plus this element not in a box, in a box for each box, okay? I've put the brackets here to just to make it visual that this thing on the right is exactly this thing, where I have boxed the things extra, okay? This, this is a bit like this minus this plus this, so to say. And now, the first element um, can be simplified. So if you remove the outer boxes, you see that you can, okay, simplify five and five to minus one using our non-operatic identity, so that's even helping us. But mostly, now these two things are equal. You have 6 and 4 and 6 and 4 to the minus 1. And again, you simplify. So you're left with the first term. Just as well, you can remove the inner brackets, like evaluate inside. And you see that now 3 times 2 is 6. And so this time, these two on the left coincide, and we can just cancel them we're left with the thing on the right, where we remove the inner boxes because we had added them. So we get our second term. So this gives us actually the term in the top left. So we are using these differences, this differencing, these like negatives to our advantage. So it's true, it's non-operatic, but you know, not all non-operatic things are bad. This time it helps. When can we do this? So you see, this idea of like summing and adding a difference is more general. So it's a bit like it's a bit like what you do when you have pullbacks, as I said. So what's the idea? 
So think of like a fine spaces or vector spaces. Suppose that you have three points in some vector space. Now, what's u plus w minus v? That's the, the third, that, that's the missing point of a parallelogram. So, this doesn't have to be a rectangle, that could be any parallelogram. So take any three points, then doing one plus the other one minus the third one is just the missing point of a parallelogram, okay? So, that's how in affine spaces you can talk about, you know, translations even if we don't have the zero, even if we don't have the vector space. It's like, it's a bit like saying, okay, see how you obtained u from v? like this difference, this vector, do it to w. Or equivalently, see how you obtained w from v, this vector, do it to u. Okay? This is also the same thing as solving a proportion, now multiplicatively. So if x is to a when as b is to c, how do you find x? Multiply b and a and subtract uh, and divide by c. That's the same thing. c plus rule of v, no multiplicative. So again, what's the intuition? Well, you see how b is to c. Now do that to a, right? Apply this proportion to a. That's what x is, because x is to a. Okay? More generally, a Malchev theory is a theory that can be interpreted in this way. So in rigor, it's a theory containing what's called a Malchev operation. It's a ternary operation that satisfies these axioms. What, what does that mean? Well, that means, the ternary operation means, um, basically, uh, see what you did from the second element, like, see what you did to the second element to obtain the third one. Do it to the first element. Okay, so here it says, see, see how you can go from A to B, now do it to A, what do you get? B, okay, and the second one says, see how you go from B to B, like that operation that given B obtains B, do it to A, what do you think? A, okay? So multiple operation is, has this idea of like, See how you go from the second to the third, now do it to the first one. A bit like proportions, a bit like affine spaces. So groups have this, but just, you know, taking x, y to the minus one, z. Or imagine the same additively, like x minus one plus z. Or heaps. So heaps, if you don't know what a heap is, a heap is to a group as an affine space is to a vector space. Like, uh, they're actually pretty much the same as torsors, except that they are... Uh, there are torsors as an algebraic structure, like instead, uh, like written written differently, basically. Okay. Uh, so for all these things, for all these modes of theory, uh, we can have this interpretation, and we can apply this trick. So for modes of theories, the composition square is weakly Cartesian, and the reason is pretty much the example I showed you before. You can just take the the relevant difference and complete the square. We can tell even more, actually, it's a very well-known result uh, that every internal reflexive relation in the category of algebras of a multiple theory is actually transitive. So this is a very well-known result, all right? So yeah, so this gives us an additional structure. This gives an additional class of theories where we can compose uh, partial evaluations. Um, okay, so uh, maybe that's again another moment to have a short break. Any questions about this? Please allow for uh, the latency time. Okay, we're past the latency time and there's no questions. Great. Um, so yeah, so that's what we, uh, that's part of what we did so far. Um, with the group, we also worked on some further questions uh, that I haven't presented today, uh, which are still a work in progress and so here are the questions. So first of all, we see when we can compose partial evaluations and we see that there are like identities. When are they actually a category? So when we have associativity and so on. 
Or sometimes we saw that we have weak composition, we have many composites. Okay, so when are they like a weaker version? Like when are they a quasi category? An infinity one category. Or another question is like we saw sometimes these forming differences or going back and negative. So when in general can you invert the partial evaluation? When can you go back? We saw that for group actions you can, for monoid actions, not always. And the weaker version of that is like, well, when do we have an infinity groupoid? Like when when does this like partial evaluation simplicial set for mechan complex? When does the bar construction for mechan complex? So we have partial answers. So first of all, it's known that for plain operatic theories, the bar construction is the nerve of a category. So yeah, a partial answer to when do they form a category as well for plain operatic theories. Now, once, uh, one thing that one may wonder is, okay, so for symmetric operatic theories, we have this weakly Cartesian composition. Do we have a quasi-category? The answer is no. The answer is surprisingly no. We were surprised, but it makes sense. Uh, the structure is weaker in a different way that's kind of orthogonal to, to quasi-categories. So we're actually working actively now on how does this differ from the nerve of a category. And it's not a quasi-category in general. We have counterexamples. For multi theories, the bar construction is a kind of complex, so in particular we have inverses, and that makes sense because you know multi theories have this like differences in some sense. So so yeah, there we have even an infinity group point, which if you want is a consistent to check, because that basically means that you can treat the bar construction as uh, a topological space, basically, right? It's an infinity group point, which tells you that group cohomology, for example, group cohomology, uh, indeed can be studied using cohomology as if it were a space. Well, it is a space in some sense. So it makes sense that this thing is a, is a kind of complex. But of course, uh, these are all partial answers. We may come up with more um, as we go along. All right. Um, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Um, so here are some references. So. If you want to learn more about partial evaluations, we made some lecture notes for the ACT school last year. They're on the archive. You can find them here. If you're interested in how this will work out, there's this uh, paper which is still in preparation with, that we're working together with the ACT school. If you want some spoilers on what's happening in the paper or to re-view uh, what, what was said during this talk, then uh, of course you can re uh, watch this video again. But, also, you can look, go to the N Category Cafe. There are two blog posts, like Partial Evaluations 1 and Partial Evaluations 2, written by the former students of the ACT school, where they explain everything in detail with lots of diagrams. So, yeah, I think I'll stop here. So, uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm here for questions. Uh, again, please use the chat. All right, I see that there are no questions. Well, we had quite some during the talk, actually. Uh, so we will accept more questions offline in case, uh, feel free to send us an email. And, uh, well, then I think I'll stop here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it was really great to have you all here. Uh, see you all next week. So we are actually, uh, ready to host also remote speakers. So you don't have to be here with me if you want to give a talk online. We can connect to you again, uh, remotely and then stream you, uh, so... Uh, I'm glad we didn't have any connection glitches. So uh, next week we'll have uh, a new talk remotely. Uh, I hope to see you there. And uh, well, uh, I think that's all for now. Uh, but oh, wait, 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 wait. There is actually a question. Um, do the simplicial sets that you get from this have nice properties like confluence. Yes, 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 they do. They do, they do, they do. Um, again, the total evaluation works in general, but not every simplicial set is, uh, is confluent, I suppose, right? Or do you mean every simplicial set that's obtained as a bar construction. No, okay, so I think what's happening is that, okay, uh, the bar construction, as, as long as you do it in a set or like in a suitable category, uh, is confluent, 
but that's confluence of partial evaluations. So partial evaluations are basically the bar construction. Um, so if you have any other simplicial set, then I guess it's hard to interpret it as uh, it's hard to interpret it in terms of partial evaluations, right? So I guess if you did, then you could use, if you could find such an interpretation, then you can use the same diagrams because uh, all the diagrams that I've used are basically, uh, all the diagrams that I used are basically the simplicial identities. Uh, so I guess if one can translate the interpretation, the same thing would work. But, uh, but so I haven't tried to do that. So if we want, uh, we can uh, we can try to discuss it uh, at some point and try to see if there's a notion of confluence for general simplicial sets. But I I guess for general simplicial sets the idea is that whenever you have two elements like two two vertices that are in the same connected component, two zero cells in the same connected component, then uh, you can always map them. To uh, you can always map them to well, pretty much the same connected component. So it's kind of the notion of same connected component, I guess. But yeah, maybe there's a more subtle way, and we can try. Okay, somebody else is saying, is there a, a relation with topos? So I don't know if you mean topos as in topos theory or as in topos the institution. Uh, so in topos theory, I don't know. I uh, I really haven't looked into that. So we did this in the category of sets, which is a topos, but the category of algebras that we have, uh, I don't know if they form a topos, I guess no. I mean, no, because there's all sorts of algebraic structures in there and they don't usually form a topos. Uh, with the institution, not really, but uh, of course I'm in the same group like the MIT category group with uh, Davis, Pivak and Brandon Fong, which are well, founders of the topos institution. Okay, anything else? Okay, yeah, there's a second question. Does the homology have any interpretation in terms of rewriting? That's a very good question. So um, I know that John Bias, in his uh, uh, this week's seminar, like on mathematical physics, this week, this week's find on mathematical physics has talked a bit about the bar construction and how to view it from the point of view of cohomology. So I think he is the person to ask for this thing. Um, but of course, cohomology captures a bit more like the transitive closure of partial evaluations, more like the infinity groupoid generated by partial evaluations. So sometimes that is partial evaluations, such as for multiple theories. Sometimes, of course, you have to generate it. There's some, I guess there's some kind of a junction. And, uh, and homology captures that, so I guess it does. There's a more general question of homology can help with rewritings in general. And I guess so. So uh, higher rewriting is actually quite a thing. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying syzygies are like homology for algebraic rewriting. Yeah, that's pretty much the idea. Um, so I guess you can, and uh, so in general, the higher structure of rewritings, with rewritings or rewritings, is apparently a huge field. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, but but yes, I guess it can. I guess it can, and I guess it can be even used for questions like not quite confluence, but the thing is, when you do have confluence, then do the two ways somehow also agree in a higher sense? So I guess for these things, for these questions, homology can help at least to have like a to say to detect when they don't they don't agree, just like in topology. So, I I think so. But yeah, so, so Matteo Capucci is right. The key word is uh, syzygies. Uh, that's actually what what John Bice was explaining in uh, in his blog post. Okay, any more questions? Okay, it seems that we don't have more questions. Okay, so now we're really close. Thank you all for coming, and uh, see you next week if you're interested. Everybody stay safe.